Most day camps fancy themselves masters of the art of circle time, but I doubt that most look at it as an act of restorative justice. To quote the golden Bob Ditter metaphor, camp is about making change. And Emily Galinsky is going to walk us through a framework that you're going to want to use with your team this summer when we start seeing those challenging behaviors from the pandemic. She also has a phenomenal metaphorical take on our lovable, less typical kids involving tacos that I can't wait for you to hear. This is the Day Camp Pod. Welcome back, my friends, to the Day Camp Podcast. I'm Andy Pritikin, Director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake Park District, Crystal Lake, Illinois. And we are day camp professionals dedicated to the development of our colleagues, discussing topics and best practices that can improve our organizations and ourselves. And we are joined today by the lovely, charming Emily Galinsky from Massachusetts. How are you doing, Em? Hey, I'm great, Andy. Thank you for having me. How are you? This is so exciting. This is Emily's first podcast, their maiden voyage. And you're going to hear she is going to be made for this format, this platform. To no, bestow. You tell me. I believe yeah. you. Yeah, listen, it's this is a wisdom bestowing platform. Okay. And you got wisdom to share. Okay. So I had heard about Emily Galinsky because one of my colleagues had been to one of her tri-state sessions and was talking about tacos and I was all confused and sounded really cool. Um, we got to hire her because Emily does staff training, which we'll talk about later. But um, I got to see her at the 2021 ACA national virtual thing. Um, and, and it was spectacular. It really was. I, I really, you know, the, the title of the session was restorative justice and I didn't know what to expect. I was this going to be a black lives matter thing. Like I had no idea where this was going to go. Emily. And, um, I was ready for anything. It was like first thing in the morning, I was ready for anything. And it ended up being about circle time. And I'm like, Whoa, like, it, it, and, and it was like, it was the science of circle time. And um, at my camp, I think it's like the most super important thing. And I would hope that it is at all other camps um, and the camps I've started. I've made sure it's an important thing at those places too. Um, at Liberty Lake, a camp where every Monday there's new kids coming in and every Friday there's kids leaving. Um, and yet, and we're an elective camp. So the group in non-pandemic times does a lot of splitting up. So this time that they do spend together as a group is just so important. And in this day and age, I mean, God, especially this summer, these kids coming from, I mean, even the kids that are in schools are six, sitting six feet apart from each other in, in, with masks on. You know, there's no sense of group. There's no sense of community. They Kids are, it's been a year and a half they will have, right? That they're going to have lost it. And, and circle time this summer is going to be so important. And, and I, am, I, I welcome you to, to give us a little insight uh, on, on your perspective of this, Em. Awesome. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting because camps do, you're right, I mean, they do circle time so well, right? We circle up for games. We circle up for activities. We circle up for songs. We, we circle up for awards. We do all of these great things. I am in love with this idea of using the circle, which is already such a, an automatic part of our camp life as a tool for restorative justice and for conflict resolution, right? So it becomes this, this thing where we're already talking about making friends and we're already about being together in the group and respecting everybody and everyone has a chance to talk. And then we can also apply it when things are not going as well, um, right? And so um, that's, that's kind of where I get into circle time. Um, I really love the idea of how can we take this very cool thing that camps are already so into and just expand it so that it can be the most beneficial time of the day. Because obviously we want kids to like be doing archery and swim lessons and all of these things. Uh, but like you said, after the year that they've had, the social emotional learning is such a huge part of things. Yeah, cir know. circle circle time is more important than shooting a bullseye this summer. Sorry to tell you. Sorry to tell your archery specialist that. But they can do circle time at archery, frankly. They can do it too. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, and what I think will surprise once you get into it, and we're going to let you get into it in a second. What I think what's going to surprise people is that most camps are scratching the surface. Most counselors, most nice, normal 20 year olds that you put in charge of a group of eight year old girls or whatever are just really scratching the surface at what they can really do during circle time. Agree. Very much agree. 
Um, and I think it's it's interesting because when we teach circles for restorative justice, we talk about this very fundamental change in how we respond to rule violations and to misbehavior. And, and so we talk about how can we help make everybody accountable for what's going on. Um, and the only way to do that is if there is trust in the group, right? So especially in programs where they are switching out to go to electives or not spending time you know, with the same kids all day long, it's so important for them to understand that there is that home group, there is that, um, dare I say, cohort uh, in the non-COVID sense of the yeah. word, right? There is this group that they can come back to that has their back, that knows a little bit more about them, that understands where their, maybe their frustrations are uh, and can help them solve some of the problems that come up, you know, during the, during the average camp day, mm -hmm. right? Johnny stole my lunch and now I'm really mad. And instead of the, you know, the counselor coming over and telling Johnny, like, you're a bad kid, not that they would ever do that, but right, instead of telling Johnny that they've caused a problem, to be able to facilitate a conversation between Johnny and the kid who is now super hungry and wants his lunch back. Yeah, um, well, let's talk, let's, talk, let's talk about what they would normally do, right? Because they wouldn't say you're a bad kid, but they would probably say, we don't do that here, right? That's what or, I hear a lot. Things like we that. We don't do that here. That's not- Yeah, that's we don't do that at Liberty Lake, right? That's disrespectful, right? Yeah. But the problem is they're not naming the behavior. They're not delving into it. They're not being specific. They're not, they're not gonna make any change in that. Right. And behavioral change, I mean, let's be honest, you know, it takes weeks and weeks of repetitive, intentional action to create a behavior change. So it's not necessarily the fact that we're trying to like change long-term this child's view of whether or not they should be taking some other kid's lunch. I mean, we would like to, we would hope that over the course of a summer at one of our camps, kids would understand the, the wider issues of respect and caring for others and things like that. But in the moment, you know, you have this seven-year-old that just like liked something in Kevin's lunchbox um, and took it. And now Kevin is upset. And, you know, there doesn't need to be punishment for that. There doesn't need to be discipline because the purpose of a consequence is teaching. And so often our younger staff or our newer staff are thinking, okay, well, they did something wrong. Now there has to be, you know, we, we try right. to teach. Right, an eye for an eye. <laughs> And and my yogurt, I'm totally taking your kudos bar, right? Right. Well, yeah, there's people that think that way. And and also, Emily, the rest of the group, when something goes wrong, right? When when this kid does something bad to that kid, there's the issue between those kids. But just as important is the other 15 kids in the group who are looking at this and saying, okay, now what happens? Absolutely. And and it's interesting because the the idea of circles and restorative justice balances that out, right? So in a, in a typical situation, we picture a seesaw, which I, all of us have at camp, I think probably, <laughs> um, right? Um, if, we, if we picture a seesaw, when somebody does something wrong, okay? So Kevin has, I don't remember, did Kevin steal the lunch or was he getting his lunch stolen? Let's go with a new name, Benjamin. When Benjamin <laughs> uh, steals, <laughs> steals Katie's lunch, what often happens is all the attention goes to Benjamin. And the seesaw really tips in favor of attention going to the perpetrator, um, which is very frustrating, you know, for Katie, who's over here being like, mm, but I'm the one that doesn't have a lunch anymore, right? Um, and instead, this kid who's acting out, there's a reason they're acting out. There's something behind that behavior. And at the end of the day, they're getting so much attention for it that instead of, even if we're addressing it, even if we're saying, there's, you know, this isn't something we do at camp. This isn't the way that we handle this. They're still getting attention for it. And so it's unfortunately reinforcing what they're looking for anyway. And it's not helping our counselors be successful with group management. Right. So and there's, there's, justice, there's generally, there's generally one kid in every group that will thrive on that negative attention as well. Absolutely. And would jump off the top of that teeter totter if it was not. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and, yeah. and going back to the rest, what's the rest of the group looking at? They're going, wow, I guess he's cool. Right. And that's how I get attention. Apparently. Is yeah. Do things that that's how you get to the top of the food right. chain. Right. Exactly. And so with, when you talk about circles and hand, handling issues as part of a circle or as part of a conversation between two people, instead of a punitive, you know, I'm telling you this, then you balance out that tear totter and the person who's been harmed in that situation has an equal voice to say, hey, this is why that upset me. And, and this is why it wasn't okay. Um, and, and so the, uh, the rest of the group is also seeing, oh, it's okay to say that my feelings were hurt. It's okay to use feelings language. 
uh, and no one's going to laugh at me. So if this does happen to me later on, I can also say, hey, it's not okay. I don't like it when that happens. I don't have to be quiet or think, oh, people are going to be mad at me if I bring this up because there's a process in place in the group for that conversation to happen really safely. You know, there's, there's a, um, a friend school down the road from here. There's a lot of friend schools down here in New Jersey, uh, Quaker schools, and they have these whole like town meeting kind of things uh, where they've sort of create this culture of, of people standing up and, and speaking how they feel kind of things. And it really is special and awesome. This is, this is exactly, and if you're looking for a fantastic camp that does this, where it's like at the heart of their camp, so right, so Jack and Laura's camp, um, Stomping Ground, this is, restorative justice is their model and it's what they do 24 seven. That's a, of course a residential camp, but, um, but they really take circles to the next level. And it's, it's possible to do it in a day camp setting, in an overnight setting, it's possible to do it in a shorter period of time uh, to use the concept of, like you said, that town meeting or that, that bringing people together to say, hey, I have something to say and it's important. And it's important enough that I feel confident to say it in front of everyone. And I know that I'm not gonna get laughed at. And then if I have a suggestion that people are gonna listen to me and hear what I've had to say, and there's a huge amount of equity and growth and independence that comes from letting kids sort out their, their troubles that way. Um, instead of staff coming in and being prescriptive and saying, well, this is what we're gonna do. He's not only is he gonna return your lunch today, but tomorrow he's gonna bring you something fun for your lunchbox. And you're like, what? That's okay. <laughs> like you're punishing his mom, <laughs> right? Who now has to go and like bring you, your friend a snack. Um, and it, yeah. it doesn't teach the kids anything, right? Yeah. So this is all about- You know, and, and I, and you know, I. I ask people to give this restorative justice phrase a chance, right? It does sound like a very leftist, liberal, like crazy thing. It is not. You know, I'm, I'm good friends. One of our former podcast guests, uh, Yoni from Eden Village, his big thing with me, at least when he started his camp, was nonviolent communication. And it's the same sort of concept. Like, it sounds like this hoity-toity, like, weird, you know, thing. But when you read about it, it's just like how to talk in a way that doesn't, you know, that's not, that doesn't create like, you know, you're not stabbing people while you're talking to them. Right. It's like really yeah, important. Never, it can't never a good idea, by the way, but, you know, <laughs> verbally. Right. But, but this restorative justice is the same thing. Um, let me read you something. I did a quick little Google search yesterday on restorative justice. And this is what Google came up with, right. At restorativejustice.org, by the way. All right. The three big ideas. Okay. Justice requires repairing harm, right? So harm got done. Justice is repairing that, right? Number two, encountering, right? The best way to determine how to do that is have the parties decide together, right? So that's the circle time. That's the actual discussion. It's not somebody saying, this is what, you know, somebody like the judge, like the counselor is the judge with the long white hair saying, this is, I'm, I'm decreeing the, the punishment right now kind of thing, right? And number three, this is the favorite, transformation. This is what causes fundamental change in people, relationships, and communities. Community meaning your group, your camp yeah. group. Yeah, no, you, you hit the nail on the head. And that's, um, that's, those are the three pillars of, what, you know, restorative justice. And um, and sometimes I, I, I talk about this, you know, engagement of all was one of the ones you were talking about, right? That everyone is part of, of that community. And so everyone is involved in the healing, right? Um, and so nobody walks away from the conversation feeling uh, unjustly done by, right? Like nobody has made a decision for them. No one has, has said, this is how you have to be okay. And I think a lot of times we do teach our staff, you know, it's, it's really important that kids apologize to each other and, and shake hands. But what we're actually teaching in that situation is we're telling kids, adults say this is how you need to fix what's going on and you have to accept an apology and you have to be okay with it. And in actuality, like obviously if we're talking about, you know, one kid cut in front of another kid in line, probably an apology is okay. But in situations where there's more emotional disruption or yeah. where someone's been being mean, like- Let's just cut to the chase. Johnny, Johnny hit Billy, right? mean it, it yeah it's Johnny keeps doing it as soon as okay yeah we're gonna shake hands and we're gonna say we're you know when the adults are watching we're gonna be cool but you know there's so much more so I love you know one of those pillars that you're talking about this obligation to put things right it's a a moderated process and and we're addressing what happened and we're not saying like it's not the lesson that like sorry fixes everything because it doesn't but talking things through and understanding other people's point of view 
that goes a real long way in terms of fixing things. For right. Because the perpetrator, why did he do it? Right. It's not just how, how the, how the kid that got hit feels, but it's why did that kid do it? You know, what, what brought this kid's emotional duress so high that he felt he had to lash out. Right. right. And and Emily. Where, oh yeah. You, you had said one comment earlier too, which was, you said it very casually, but it's so important. I think staff don't understand it, that the purpose of consequence is teaching. And that's, you know, the, your whole system, it sounds like is based around that, but that's important and not a given in most people's minds. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I do want to say, um, definitely not my system. <laughs> um, I love it and I am a champion of it, but I take no responsibility for creating this concept of, of circles and, and conflict resolution. Maybe I'll take some credit for spreading the word about how awesome it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I think that it, it's so helpful for our kids, but it's also so helpful for our staff because they get frustrated dealing with the same situations over and over again. And so when we're actually giving them, and I think Andy used it earlier, when we're actually giving them a model that can have change, then instead of this situation happening every day over and over, like maybe there's an opportunity here for our group to progress in terms of their social emotional skills and, and, and things. So, um, And you're putting the whole group on the same page, which I love. I love that fact. But I just want to go back, take a step back to uh, Johnny hit Billy kind of thing, right? And the typical thing that happens right is that we say johnny you need to apologize to billy all right and you did a really great explanation of that in your in, a, in their session can you sort of take us through like what's really happening there yeah, I mean, i'm not a fan of making kids apologize um first of all the the child that's been harmed may not be ready and second of all it's, it's definitely not ready even if we wait right like what is that apology what does that mean at the end of the day that is you know that is adults telling kids, this is how you fix something, right? Um, and you're telling Johnny, you can fix this physical thing that you did um, by just saying the words, I'm sorry, like this magic, <laughs> like, oh, it's done, like you win, um, you know, and, and he's supposed to walk away with no guilt or no worry. And then what does he learn, right? That next time he hits someone, he could just, he doesn't even need to wait for an adult to tell him, he'd just be like, oh, sorry, like <laughs> that's not gonna work, right? And then, yeah. you know, for, for Billy, maybe he's not ready to hear that apology. Even if he does hear it, maybe he wants to find out like what happened that made you, like you said, Andy, like what, where did that come from? Now, if we're talking about five or six year olds, there's still a great benefit to using the word sorry. Frankly, there's a benefit of all, at all ages to use the word sorry. But I think that the better option is to say, I think that Johnny would really appreciate, wait, see, I got confused again. Did Johnny hit Billy or the other way? Who cares? Doesn't matter, just keep going. Right. Okay. Um, I think that Johnny would really appreciate an apology because his feelings are hurt. And when you're ready and he's ready, I think it would be really nice if you said, I'm sorry. What else do we need to do though to make this right? And so you're introducing this concept that sorry is a part of it, but you're putting it on the kiddo to decide when they are ready to give that apology. The chances are it's going to be so much more sincere than the like, drive by i'm sorry which i like equivalent to like the you know the high fives at the end of a little league game exactly okay. it's where's just it's the, the same the juice where's right. the juice that's exactly <laughs> what i was thinking it took me back to a michael brandwine session about um his you know define label and praise thing that you know you don't you don't just go up to the kid and say hey, emily great job today high five right and walk away because emily's just like well, what did i even do right it's the same thing with this it's being specific right as specific as terrific to quote michael um <laughs> Like, so, can I so, a that does that? Yes, trust me, Brandy, who works with me, would love that. So, um, so, so, okay, so, so you had that conversation with Johnny, who hit Billy. Okay, so Johnny hit Billy. We're we're gonna get oh, this straight sure. now. Yep, okay, so, so, so you had this. So you said, you know, at some point you should, you know, apologize to him and all that kind of thing, because they're both heated at this point, because mm -hmm. you know, taking the temperature of the situation is super important and all. Okay, so now everybody had lunch let's say and now they're in rest time or whatever before the next activity and you say hey guys let's sit down and talk yeah. okay yeah, i think with with this situation what you want to do first of all whenever you have kids that have gotten into it um i think our tendency is to rush to the conclusion like let's get it fixed and move on um but what we really want to do like you said is take the temperature of the situation and realize that people need to bring it down a little bit 
everyone benefits from the opportunity to take a few deep breaths and think through what they did and what they could have done differently. Depending on how serious it is, like again, I, I mean, a kid hitting another kiddo, that's a pretty big deal. Um, and so I think that in that situation, you have a counselor speak with each kiddo individually. And one of the, the best ways to do that is, you know, you do it over lunch, right? You know, um, but say to that, to that kiddo, what happened? You know, what were you thinking at the time? What are you thinking about it now? Now that we're going back to it, you know, what, what maybe are we thinking now about it? And then what do you think we need to do to fix this? Right. And so if you're the, if you're the kiddo that's been hit, you're thinking, well, I want him to apologize, but also like, I don't want to be hit again. And the counselor can say that that's totally legit. Yeah. And, and they also usually say, and I thought I was friends with Johnny. Right. And, and so you, and so then that counselor can say, do you think you're still friends? Is that a question that you want to ask him? You know, when we, when we sit down and talk and it's like, no, I don't, I don't know that I want to ask that question. Well, that's okay. You know, like, so we're not putting kids in the position, we're putting the idea in their head, we're helping them along the path, but we are asking both the, the kiddo that was harmed and the child that did the harming, what do you think is needed to fix this situation? And, you know, we, get, we don't give kids enough credit. The reality is, is a lot of that stuff happens in the heat of the moment. And the fact is, is that Johnny is going to know absolutely that he needs to apologize. Um, you know, I, I probably should say, I'm sorry. Like, it might be grudging. You know, he might be like, well, I guess I should, you know, apologize. I like shouldn't have done it. You're like, yeah, no, absolutely. I think he would really appreciate that. Uh, and then you bring them together. Um, and I think it's really important, though, when you are talking individually, it can take a minute or two. It doesn't have to be 45 minute interrogation, right? Mm -hmm. it's, when you do bring them together, just before you do that, it's so important to tell each one of them, I'm going to ask you the same stuff when we're all talking together. So this was kind of our practice. You can practice with me. And then awesome. I'm going to ask you to say this to your friend. I love it. You can hear it too. All right. So now how do you preface this to the rest of the group when you're, you're about to have this circle time now? Yeah. So I think, so I would say about 80% of the work that you're going to do in circle is the fun stuff that we're already doing at camp, right? Mm -hmm. Games and getting to know you and talking and stuff. And then I just want like 50% of the time you're talking about circle as actually a really small circle, which can just be. Johnny and Billy and the counselor. Um, so when we're thinking circle, it doesn't have to include everyone. I would say there's only probably about, I don't math very well, but like, I think that leaves 5%, give or take. Um, I think that there's only probably about 5% of the time where you have what I would call like an intervention, where you actually ask everybody to be in the circle. And right. Witness and yeah. I mean, but those, that 5% of the time is a really freaking important 5% of the time. So, you know, just thinking at a, at a, at a camp like mine, where I have a lot of older girls, they start getting nasty with each other at some point, talking behind each other's back and start forming like little tribes within the group, you know, yeah. Yeah. right? Like yeah. that's when we need to have a, a serious circle time. So I would say you have to have a structure for that. And that's something you want to teach your staff at the beginning of the summer. You don't want to be first teaching staff to do this. And you also want to make sure your counselors feel comfortable. And if they don't, I really recommend bringing in um, right, a the division leader staff member right. or a exactly. leadership staff to help out. Yeah, especially with teenage girls. Never, ever want to leave like one counselor alone with teenage girls in a circle because like you might need a new staff member. Right. They might eat them for lunch. Right. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I think that what's really important is that, that, that you set expectations. So you say to the kids as a whole, and this is every day when you do circle so that it's normalized so that when it's time to have this tough circle, these are the things I know. We speak from the heart. We say just enough to get our point across, right? We're not here to like crucify people. Like this isn't about stabbing our friends in the back. We're going to say enough that people understand what's going on, but we don't need to be rough or mean. We're going to listen to everyone with the respect that we would want. And this one's really important. We're going to remain in the circle. We're not going to get upset and stomp off because then we're, our voice doesn't get heard. And right. And then, and then we have to like reconvene at another time. Right. And then we're going to honor confidentiality. This is something that's happening in our group, right? The Oaks are having this conversation. It doesn't, the Maples don't need to know about it. They don't need to know about it now. They don't need to know about it on a bus ride home. This is something that's happening just with our group. Um, and for, you know, as much as possible, then we say what we're going to do is we're going to ask everybody that has something to say to say their piece. We're going to go around the circle. You can choose to pass or you can choose to say something. And you'd be amazed how many kids will say, I'm watching these guys fight and I don't get it. I don't understand what's going on. I just want to have fun at camp. And it's frustrating that this is what we're doing right now instead of 
being on the inflatable. Oh, there's always a lot of that. Yeah, that's always a couple sentiments, no doubt. Yeah, for sure. Uh, One of the first things you said about this process, which that was great, Emily. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to come up with a couple more examples because there's just so many. But um, Sam, you you think of one while I'm talking. So um, (laughs) the... uh, was I going to say? Oh yeah. The first thing you said was make circle time a regular event so that you're not just convening when someone's going on trial. (laughs) Right. Right. So, so because like if I'm Andy, the camp director and I never talk to the counselors and then I say, Emily, I need to talk to you. Emily's thinking she's getting fired. Right. And it's the same thing. Right. If the counselors say, Hey guys, we need to have a circle time. And they're like, Oh God, what did we do wrong now? Right. So this kind of thing, um, you know, like at my camp, every single Monday, we do one with every group because there's new kids and we just got to meet who the new kids are and find out about them, you know. And then on Tuesday, we do it because we have a star point like, you know, we have our like our golden points, you know, of, of character kind of thing. So we have a different one every week. And, and on on Tuesday, we talk about that and what it looks like at camp and all that kind of thing, too. Um, and then, you know. I want them to have circle times throughout the week, you know, not necessarily at the beginning of the day, it could be in the middle of the day, it could be at the end of the day, whatever, just because it makes you feel like a little community, a little team. And going back to what we said at first, this and coming out of what they're coming out of, they need this more. Now, frankly, they, the fact is they needed it all the time. There should be circle times all the time, any, even when there's not a pandemic going on, but silver lining, pandemic silver lining, ring the bell, ding, ding, ding. Thank goodness is that <laughs> is that people are realizing how important this kind of basic camp 101 crap is right it's interesting too because schools want to do this but they can't right and so so we think so true circle time right so true kindergarten after day of circle time you sit on the mat you know now right and maybe not maybe you sit on mat six feet apart now but um right but so so this is where the concept of it from camp came from, right? Is, is that our educators who, who lead and teach at camp are right. like, oh, have you heard about this amazing circle time thing? <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted to get, like, it, we don't think about it as much for like fourth or fifth grade boys who are like off the bus and ready to be doing baseball. And we're like, wait, we're going to ask them to sit still for a second? No, not until they've gotten some energy out, right? It's not going to be successful. And so we have to look at how we structure circle time. It might be different for teenage girls than it is for five-year-olds or four-year-olds. But there's an opportunity during every day to bring the group together and to have that moment. And this is where, you know, like this is where the secret handshakes can be formed. And this is where like some of that dynamic of like, yeah, we're the maple leaves or whatever, um, <laughs> you know, like that can happen. But most importantly, it's where your social emotional learning curriculum gets highlighted. Applied. Applied for sure. And also like maybe each week you tell your staff this week we're going to work on you know being nice to our friends i don't know pick a thing right integrity so, social integrity there you go sounds like a star point so mm-hmm. <laughs> right so this week is going to be our week about integrity so each day at circle time we're going to talk about one thing that's related to integrity and so maybe wednesday afternoon you're sitting around having a popsicle and you're talking about you know how did someone in the group show integrity today right and, or maybe if they're five years old, just, what is integrity? What is this big word? What does it mean? Right. And they are starting to do this in school and there is starting to become grant money and things available for it. But camp, camp do it so much better. We have so much more opportunity for it. If we're not doing it, we're missing well, it. Well, Emily, not just that, but in school, they're probably not allowed to sit in circles right now and do it. But at camp this summer, we actually are. So we so. can do it and camps and, and schools can't even, aren't even allowed to do it right now. So like we have a golden ticket to do this. Now, I, I have a singing the Willy Wonka song in my head. I have a great um, example of what you're talking about and how it was so important at one point. A teen, two teen campers. One is kind of the cool older teen camper. One's annoying because he's a little hyperactive, but he wants to be like the other guy. And he came up and knocked the ball out of his hands during while they were in line because he wanted to hang out with them, but he did it in a really annoying way. So new counselor 
doesn't see this as an, anything but a little teeny thing that just happened, but it's a symptom of something that's escalating, right? So catching it, talking to each one, you find out the one guy just wants to hang out and the other guy, when he realizes that individually, when you brought them back together, it was so amazing the change. Where if we hadn't addressed it in that way, like you're talking about, it would have just escalated into punches at some point. Yeah, and that kid would have gone home thinking, I don't have any friends at camp, and instead went home thinking, oh, someone understands me. And, and also like learns how to maybe make that approach better the next time because that kid can say to him, you know, if you want to talk to me, just like walk up and talk to me. Exactly. You know? So when you're exactly. saying, what, what do you think about what happened? What do you need to move forward? Or what, what would have been more helpful in that situation? And he could say like, I'm happy to be friends, dude. I just don't want you to come and take the ball. Like just ask me to play and I'll pass it to you. And both of them felt listened to and, and that they could try it this way again if they had a problem instead of just going to the violence. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That is a perfect example. And that is what we want ultimately. I mean, so we talk about, you know, mediation, intervention, restorative justice, whatever, whatever we want to call it, you know, um, amazing circles, <laughs> you know, whatever we want to call it. The idea is, is that we are replacing things like zero tolerance policies, which are not equitable right, and which don't keep kids in camp, right, we're replacing those with understanding that talking through things is the consequence for some kids, it's the learning, that's what we're trying to do, they don't have to be kicked out of camp or suspended or removed from the group, they can do that work within the group, and then find the acceptance of realizing that, like, no one is perfect, and today was their day not to be perfect, and tomorrow it'll be someone else. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is going to be this summer is going to be the epitome of like, don't judge a book by its cover. Now I'm going to sing the Barney song because we're singing hokey songs right now, by the way. <laughs> but um, one of my favorites from my kids childhood. Um, but, you know, we all have to be little social workers this year. We all have to be able, and when I say we, I mean your 16 year old counselor, like everyone is going to be have to look at a behavior and look beneath it. Because though that, that example Sam gave, which is just such a typical and awesome example of what happens in a camp, it's going to be all about that this year. It's going to be kids not knowing how to express themselves. Yeah, that, and that decoding. And if we can teach our staff to do that ahead of time, that's great. But if we can't teach them to decode or they're not remembering to do that, then giving them this method to ask questions, which ultimately accomplishes the same thing. Yeah, this is how you decode. There in the end. Right, yes, exactly. right. Talk Here's about it. The secret plan. Talk about and it. Don't jump like, to conclusions. Getting staff to realize that those little things are to catch the escalation before it hits the roof, to see those little things. I mean, that's something that you learn over time. And now that counselor has been with me like five years, but in the beginning, she didn't know. Right, but the, the problem I see is that we hire a whole bunch of like young Andy Pritikins who think that they can conquer the world at age 17. And they tend to think they know a lot. And the fact is they don't. And, and like that decoding thing you just said there, Emily, you have to ask questions. You can't jump to conclusions. You can't think, oh, I know what that is because it looks like this kind of thing. And I think that we hire a lot of mini firemen and firewomen and, and, and they, they get hits of dopamine in their body by resolving little problems, right? Every other high school kid that I interview, when I get to some point in the conversation where this girl says to me, well, you know, I'm the group, I'm the one in my group of friends that like everybody comes to, you know, to resolve their problems kind of thing, right? That's a tip, that's, that's like the typical profile of person that wants to work at camp, right? There's people like helping people, you know? And, and, and this is a process, you know? People are gonna have to put the work in to go digging to find out what's there. And I, I think it's so, I think what you said is so correct. And it's so important to realize too, that, you know, restorative justice and conflict resolution that works this way is not a one and done thing. It is not gonna work for this, like really, like this counselor that's like, oh, I've been to this training on restorative justice. Now my group is gonna be perfect, right? And then they go and they try and, you know, jump right to an intervention without putting in the work at circle time, without putting in the foundation of building their group. And it's gonna fall apart. And they're going to be in your office going, I'm a terrible counselor. I can't do it. I don't just give me my check. I'm running away. Right. And, and the answer to that is like, 
it takes time for everyone to learn how to do this. So let's talk through how we did it. And then you find out, it's, it's almost like decoding for staff, right? What, what did we skip? Well, we haven't really had time for a circle this week. You know, it's been busy. And then like, you know, Sarah lost her swimsuit. So we were going to do the circle, but then we had to go back to the wash house to find it. And you're like, well, how can you expect these girls to sit down and talk about their deepest innermost feelings? If like, you haven't even addressed like, what's your favorite color, right? We have right. to start somewhere. <laughs> That's one of the themes of the day camp podcast. As we talk about these important subjects is that if it's important, you make time to do it, right? You prioritize it. You know, you don't just give it lip service, you know, and day camp, my God, Emily, there, you know, there is no boathouse like, you know, day camp, we're just literally running around like chickens with our heads off, you know, from one thing to the next most of the time. And it just gives people the excuse to say there's not enough time. I hear you. I hear you. We, um, we ran a day camp at Starfish um, for several years um, as we were looking at the best way to serve, you know, local kiddos who still had extra needs. Um, and I think my favorite invention at that time was the backpack tree, which later got named Steve, um, which is where all the day camp kids were supposed to, you know, leave their backpacks and, you know, because they didn't have a cabin to live in and they left at the end of the day and everything. I swear to gosh, every night I would walk by on the way up to check the cabins at night and there would still be like half a dozen backpacks on the tree. And I'm like, Steve wants to be alone at the end of the day. All of these things are supposed to go home with you. <laughs> you know, just. I got you. All right. So I just, I have to put in a good word for our friends at CRS Commercial Recreation Specialists, the fine purveyors of the best recreation solutions to keep camp going strong. Check out their website at crs 4 rec.com because CRS is serious about fun. And Emily told me before we started this podcast that her camp, Starfish, that you guys actually are, are looking forward to some fun in the lake, huh? We are. We have we have just started our inflatables area from CRS, um, and we uh, we have a bouncy thing that has an official name, a water trampoline, maybe. There you go. Um, and we have some mats, and I think it's going to be really fun. We have we are working on our safety protocols, and we are excited to see kids having fun on it this summer because goodness knows they need it. Yeah. Well, by the way, those mats. I got to put in a plug for those mats. They are literally magic carpets for your lake. They are the, probably the cheapest thing you can buy <laughs> for a lake. <laughs> yeah. Like, like if you're buying anything from CRS or Wibbit or whatever these companies are, like literally they're the size of like an eight foot table. You can get them any size and, and they just float. <laughs> and like, if you're a kid or God forbid, even me at like, there's nothing better than floating around in a lake on a magic carpet, basically. Right. So you know, if you, it's the introductory level, right? So like, that's your little, your entry point right there. I mean, literally like 120 bucks or something like that. You can get yourself a killer pad for yeah, your Yeah, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. We definitely were like, we're going to have an inflatable park. And then we were like, with a trampoline and some mats because we are going to grow. <laughs> we're going to grow. We're going to, you know, we're starting with it. But I think it's a, you know, to put in another plug for CRS, I think it's a great investment. I think it's one of those things, you know, kids can even do archery in their backyard now, but like they don't have inflatables. And that yeah. kind of stuff at home. So like whenever we can introduce sure. them to something really cool. Camp should be about things you don't normally do at home. Absolutely. Agreed. All right, Emily, before we go on to, uh, to the awkward tacos, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself because I skipped that at the beginning. My bad. Um, see, I'm saying I'm sorry and I'm just getting away with it. That's just the way it is. We ain't having to circle and nothing. We ain't we doing or nothing. I'm sorry. So um, yeah, just tell us a little about yourself. Um, so um, you know my name, it's Emily. Um, I have been, I, I'm a camp lifer, uh, right? As so many of us professionals are. So I started at like four at day camp. I think it was seven when I first went to overnight camp. Um, I met my wife at, as counselor that, you know, we were co-counselors at day camp when we were 16. We didn't get married at 16, just gonna clarify that. But, <laughs> um, right, like camp is in my blood. It's, um, it's a huge part of, of my life. And I think for me, camp has always been about providing the opportunity for kids who wouldn't necessarily otherwise have a chance to go. Um, and so I've worked in, you know, the fresh air style camps, right? Bringing kids out of the city um, in leadership development programs, and then really got into the special needs, um, extra needs piece of things. And that's where I have lived for the past, yeah, 15 years or so. Um, I was executive director at Camp Starfish, which is in New Hampshire, uh, and is a residential and year-round program for kids with severe emotional, behavioral, social, and learning challenges. So including those awkward tacos that we're about to, <laughs> we're yeah. about to chat um, about. And that camp is interesting. It has a one-to-one -one staff to camper ratio. 
Um, and so we're able to do a lot of really cool things with getting kids to camp who wouldn't be able to be successful in a traditional camp environment. And um, I love that work. I retired from it in uh, 2020 and about a month before the pandemic opened my own business. <laughs> So that was a questionable <laughs> decision um, to open a, a camp consulting and training business because I really want to share my passion for helping people normalize behavior challenges and feel comfortable working with kids that are a little bit different. Um, and I wanted to spread that love, you know, across the industry and really elevate our ability to take good care of kids regardless of the setting. Um, right. So and then like Al Pacino and Godfather 3, they dragged you back in, I heard. They did. they did. It was, I mean, you know, yeah. So um, unfortunately, um, our transition plan didn't work out as we had hoped. And the person who took over for me did move on um, to another endeavor. And um, God bless her for, for trying through the pandemic, because I can't imagine that's an easy time to take over a, no, camp no, as no, a no. new executive director. But um, but yes, as of last month, um, she has moved on. And um, I am back in an interim capacity doing my bright moose thing full time, getting other camps ready for the great summer. And then now back at Starfish, making sure that we're ready to go for those kiddos as well. And less, yes, you heard correctly. She said bright moose. She did. She did. <laughs> she did it. People ask me about this all the time. They also ask like, did I accidentally put a rainbow in my logo? And I, I did not. I'm really into bright colors, but if you want to know, I mean, you didn't ask, but I'll tell you anyway, but it's, uh, it's bright and moose and the the word so moose is i don't really go for spirit animals but i will say that the moose as a spirit animal is a wise leader and someone that helps um and someone that can see because it's you know huge um can see the bigger picture um and and support so there's that and then right for me i feel like so much about behavior and and different kids gets pushed down and it gets it's like a dirty secret, like, oh, we have this kid who doesn't get along with others, but like, we don't want to talk about it. And I'm all about bringing that stuff into the light and normalizing the fact that every kiddo is different and every kid can succeed. And there's a way to do that and to shine a light on what some of these challenges are. So that's where Bright Moose came from. And mainly I say because Moose Bright just does not have the same ring. Yeah. You know? So brightmoose.com. Uh, brightmoostraining.com. Thank Bright you. Brightmoostraining.com. Brightmoostraining.com because the people who own brightmoostraining.com have parked it on the web, are not doing anything with it. Oh, the those turkeys. That drives me crazy. I know. I know. Brightmoostraining.com. All right. And, and there'll be more information on the show notes and all. But before we wrap it up, Awkward Tacos. Tell us about an Awkward Taco. Oh, I can tell you about a lot of Awkward Tacos. <laughs> um, awkward Tacos are my friendly way of saying kiddos with social skills deficits. Like Sam, like you were talking about, right? Like the quirky ones um, don't always quite fit in, miss the body language cues. Um, they're that kid in the group that everyone's like, oh, he's in awkward group. Um, but they are great kids. They don't understand how to make friends. And they have, for whatever reason, whether it's a diagnosis or just lagging abilities or, or whatever the issue is, they need help scaffolding their social skills so that they can be successful at camp, um, right? So we talk about some kids are social butterflies and other kids are awkward tacos uh, and you put them in the same group and you try and have what, like a butterfly taco? It doesn't always work out. So, well. um, so I'm, I'm very passionate about helping kids figure out how, I, would say, I wouldn't say kids so much, helping staff figure out how to bring the kids they have in their group together, whether or not they have the social skills um, that makes it easy. All right, so here I am, I'm 20 year old Andy, and I got this group of kids, and one of them, this boy, uh, Cameron, he is just an awkward taco, and nobody wants to deal with him because he's just so annoying and, and that kind of thing. What, what advice do you have for me? Well, I, I would tell 20 year old Andy that someday you're going to look back on this, and Cameron is going to be one of the favorite campers that you ever had um, because you are going to figure out how to make him successful at camp and you might help him make his first true friend and you are going to be a hero to him. In the meantime, it's gonna be really annoying and frustrating and tiring, um, but it's all gonna be worth it. So that's that's the first message. And then the second piece is, is more in this moment, what do we need to do? Um, I'm all about speaking directly to kids and being honest. Kids that have social skills challenges, they understand that they're different. They're used to being out of it. And so I don't like to pretend like, no, 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 the kid's like you just fine. 
I would much rather say, okay, yeah, it seems like you are having a hard time connecting with the kids in the group. What would you like to have happen? And they might say, I just want one person to play with. Or they might be like, I want everyone to like me. And depending on what they want, then 20-year-old Andy can help move them along by saying things like, well, you know, yesterday on our way to soccer, um, I didn't really think to tell you, but it might be that someone else gets the ball and that's okay. So today, when we get to soccer, what can we do if that happens again? Because yesterday you got real upset. Like you were really upset that somebody else got to touch the ball. So now, now we know that's happening. So like, what do you think we could do if that happens again? And like have that conversation and teach kids ahead of time. We call it pre-teaching or scaffolding. So you're picturing like the kind of scaffolding that goes up the side of a building that helps you know, construction workers reach the, the parts of the building that they can't reach to do the work they need to do. And then as they get that work done and as they build that section, that scaffolding can slowly come down and eventually it disappears. So the best thing that we can do is help kids actively do better with their social skills. And then they gain the confidence to ultimately try it on their own. You know, Jay Frankel did a great uh, session one time about staffing I was at where he talked about how when you're a, a leader at camp and you're in charge of other staff, how you're drawn to the kids that are like you, to the people that are like you, the, the, the easy people. And those difficult staff, you actually sort of avoid them because, you know, it's a pain in the ass. It's hard. It's hard work, right? And I think the same thing happens with these awkward tacos that um, they get, you know, people, it's, it's hard work. It's, you know, it, it's a counselor would say, Emily, it's just, it's just exhausting. It's it exhausting is. to deal with him. It is know? exhausting. And it's, it's even harder because they cling, right? So they're like clingy tacos. <laughs> um, I don't know if that makes them like burritos. But okay. like, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and they do, they cling to adults because what they've learned is that they connect better with adults. Like the average awkward taco can talk at an adult level that is incredibly impressive. And you can almost forget that you're talking to an eight-year-old. But when they're talking to other eight-year-olds, right? Those other eight-year-olds are not interested in the entire history of dinosaurs and every dinosaur <laughs> that ever grew on the earth, right? And so all those kids see is like this really annoying dinosaur freak, you know? And, um, and, and I think the other topic is like Legos or like, you know, whatever the new Minecraft is. Um, I'm super old. Like, but, right, and so they, they, they have these singular topics and adults will engage them in that because it's easy for an adult to just let a kid ramble. But what adults really need to be doing, what our staff really need to be doing is finding another kiddo in the group that might also have that interest and intentionally pairing those kids up or going to their, you know, their unit head or their camp director and saying, I know that we're scheduled for like the Lego table four days from now, but if we could go tomorrow, I think that would really help because this kiddo has been talking about Legos for two days. And if he could show everyone else how good he is at it, that might really help him grow in the group, right? So like finding that time for kids to pursue common interests together and making that super awkward taco be the star of the show just for once. Um, yeah. And then other kids are much more likely to engage them. Yeah. And every kid has something they're good at. You know, I love having a name for my awkward tacos now. This is great. And <laughs> they really are so rewarding when you get down, you know, you'll see the changes very subtly or you might not even notice them. And then at the end of the summer, you're like, wow, look how he's doing. I didn't, it snuck up on us, you know? Um, but yeah, they, everyone's got something they can shine at if you let them. Yeah. yeah and I one thing, oh, sorry, Andy. Oh, no, I was just I was just going to chime in and save that thought, Emily. But I was just going to say that, that I love what you mentioned about championing the awkward taco. I think that's something that camp people can do that that can't happen anywhere else. And and if you're, you know, Emily, the amazing dynamic group leader of this group, right, that everybody thinks is like Wonder Woman. Right. And you are championing, championing the awkward taco girl. That makes that awkward talker go somewhat cool because Emily thinks that she's cool. So now, you know, I'm going to try to be nice to her because, you know, like that peer pressure thing actually works. It changes That's your just, whole culture. It's a simple championing thing. And, and these kids generally have very low self-esteem. 
very low self-esteem. So for the, for, for them to get built up in any way, like you said, make them champion for the day, you know, like you will see their chest puff out and, and, and their whole disposition will change and they'll become nicer <laughs> and they'll become. Can we all commit to having like taco Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> That's the day we're going to pick our taco and be like, you, sir, are going to have the best camp day of your life. Right. I mean, I think the other thing too, is that, like you said about the peer pressure that can do well with kids too, because we always think about like either the awkward taco or the social butterfly, but there are kids in between. There are kids that have cachet with a group and who can push in one direction or another, whether or not other kids are considered popular, right. Or at least considered accepted. And while in the camp world, we talk about, you know, every child is accepted and, and we are all kind and we are respectful of everyone in reality when adults backs are turned. We know that that's not always the case. We strive for it, but it's not always true. And so whenever there's someone in the group who you can say, like a pretty mature kiddo in the group that's also somewhat liked, to say, you know, I think Kevin is having a super hard time making friends, right? Um, what do you think that we could do to include him in the group? And that kid's going to be like, I mean, I don't mind if he's included. And you're like, yeah, I know. But I think there are some people that don't know how to include him. So like, what if you introduced an activity and like brought him along and then other kids would follow you, right? And using that positive peer pressure. And when we do that, the technique that I always share, and this is really important, is we never want to throw a taco under the bus, right? We don't want to say anything about him that we wouldn't say to him. So I'm just as happy to say to taco, you are having a real hard time making friends. And let's be honest, everyone in that group is seeing it. It's not a secret, right? It's not like I'm like sharing his underwear size or something mm -hmm. like that. Totally scandalous, right? Like, this or, is just or more like telling everybody what drugs he's, what meds he's on. <laughs> that probably would have been a more appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> right? But like, yeah. So I, I think you're not, you're not saying anything about him that you wouldn't say to him, and instead you are bringing other people along in the process and trying to create helpers and allies um, who who don't see this as awkward, but instead see it as this opportunity for them to like help make it better for someone. And like you said, they're little camp counselors in disguise, Andy, right? Five years from now, they're going to be the ones that are like, I want to help. I want to make it better. And you can already tell that they're going to be a CIT like in just a couple of years. So why, why not use them now um, to make that taco you right. know, feel better? Yeah. I, I am here today because of an awkward taco child from my first camp job. This little seven-year-old boy, Michael Bender, who's probably like freaking 37 now. Who the heck knows? But, uh, <laughs> but man, <laughs> he was such a handful. And I was a unit leader. So I was helping out the counselors who were up in arms with him, you know? And he was a great kid. You know, his mom had left him at a young age and he was with a single dad. And the kid was ADHD off the wall, you know, and just had so much trouble socializing. And, but yet was great with me like talk to me like I was his buddy, you know, you know, and, um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, you on a selfish note, right. I mean, same thing with kids with any special needs, like you, if you can make some headway with those kids, man, like you'll feel so good about yourself, you know, it makes it all worthwhile. It's easy to take the, the young Andy Pritikin and make them, you know, have a good summer. That's simple. Just add water, you know, but for those kids, like it takes work. And that's why we do this. We're youth development professionals. Absolutely. Well said. Yeah. Thank well you. Said. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll put a bow on that. So, so is it fair to say, Emily, that we you can put some resources on our um, on our daycamppodcast.com uh, uh, show notes page, so that people can see this about the awkward tacos and about the restorative justice circles. Yes. All I right. would love to do that for sure. All right. Because honestly, this is just, this is like day camp gold, my friend. This really is. <laughs> this I love is it. just and then I would phenomenal. Also say that I will put those resources out there and people are welcome to get in touch. I love talking about problems. I love, like, that's why I do what I do, right? Like, I love helping people figure out how to, how to get kids settled and, and how to, how to make them successful at camp. Um, you know, even against their will. No, I'm just kidding. But like people can call me, they can reach out. I'm always happy to talk about, you know, larger theories of restorative justice or, hey, we have this kiddo in group four and our staff are struggling. Let me tell you what's going on and get some advice. I'm, I'm happy to, to do that and anything in between. 
Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So before we get to our program tips of the week, I just want to give a shout out to our friends at AM Skyer Insurance because AM Skyer has been around for 101 years supporting camps in PR, legal, health, facility management, general safety, and more. They are my strategic partners. That is right. They're like part of the family here. Um, experience the AM Skyer difference at amskyer.com. Once again, my giant 40 by 80 tent. It, it got destroyed at the tropical storm last August, and then it got destroyed again. It was up for three days, ladies and gentlemen, before the wind took it down. And the lesson learned is don't buy tents with two-inch piping anymore. In uh, 2021, with the weather patterns we have and global warming and all that stuff, you need anything up it needs to withstand 75 mile an hour winds these days. With steel I beams, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. So anyway, AM Skyer, no problem. What do you need, Andy? No problem. Take care of it. It's just like, oh, it's so nice not to have to worry about that aspect of this debacle um, of bad luck, of weather related bad luck. So anyway, thank you, AM Skyer. AMSkyer.com, check them out. All right. So program ticket of the week. Um, I want to tell you about something I'm doing uh, in my camp in regard to helping support my, my frontline counselors and my middle management division leaders, because I really feel like these kids are going to be getting off out of their cars and off the buses this year. And it's going to be like a box of chocolates. And even the most normal kids in past years are going to have challenges, let's call it, right? The behaviors that parents are seeing at home are crazy. And, and what, we're, what we're going to get <laughs> on the first day of camp is literally going to be like a jailbreak, right? These kids are going to be like, woo, right? They're going to be like party time. I mean, they're not going to know how to act, especially these little kids. So what I'm doing is putting in an extra level of management. I, I am for every one of my divisions, for every couple grades, I'm taking one of my like up and coming superstars and I'm not giving them a group. And I'm calling them an assistant division leader. And they are going to help with all the clerical BS that the regular unit leaders have to do. That's not mentoring and taking care of, of and walking around by supervising and calling parents and emailing parents, all that other stuff, which is honestly 80% of their job is that other stuff. So I'm going to have somebody take care of that stuff and then have a person that can be a virtual SWAT team and jump in and help a, a situation before it gets bad. All right. Uh, mine today is um, building a better sprinkler system. So if you take a PVC pipe and have your maintenance band cut some in half and cut or drill holes in other ones and provide the connectors. And so you get a bunch of that together and then you let a group just figure out how to put it together and then they can run water through it and see you know where the water goes and they can stand under it if they make it tall they can sprinkle themselves so but it's the most fun is just building whatever they're going to build together out of the pvc pipe awesome <clears throat> typical right. sam right there Sa sam is the master of like how do you get something like she's she's like the dollar store of uh of program tips Sam, that, <laughs> is, like, that, cheap. Is, that is the place to be <laughs> hey cheap is where it's at right and pvc i mean what can't you do with pvc at camp exactly seriously holes, what in signs. let me tell you pvc around your sand volleyball courts okay big fat pvc it's amazing that would actually stop the problem yeah. that we are yeah. having no no it's any time. anybody that doesn't have that you're you're a caveman if you don't have big fat like four inch pvc going around and you get the corner things like the nice smooth corner things that, that join it and stuff like that no this is this is brilliant because we just asked the kids after they're done playing that you know kick the sand yeah back away yeah from forget the that that's a I losing battle tried, tried railroad ties until we realized that they have large nails in them that is not my, my camp Amsire would not approve. <laughs> <laughs> my camp floods and the sand stays in that pvc i'm gonna try this yeah <laughs> um, all right you got anything well, yeah, I mean, you you gave me great warning um, when you said that we, we do a tip of the week. <laughs> and then I didn't realize, like I said to you earlier, I didn't realize that when you said we, you meant we, like me. So um, so I, I promised to share with you my tip of the week, which is how to choose a ripe avocado. Um, nice. Yeah, nice. I mean, I think this is really important. Don't so, shy away. I'm not going to. So here's the thing. So you, you have the avocado, right? We'll pretend that my kush ball is the avocado. And mm -hmm. there's that little button on it right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're at the grocery store, you, you just pop that little tiny button off. And if it is nice and bright and green, like those trees behind you, Andy, 
it is ready to go. So you have to squeeze it, you don't have to bother it. If it's brown or dry under there, don't buy it. It's not worth your dollar twenty nine. So that's my non camp tip of the week, and then I'll give you my camp tip. Of the week, which is probably more like what you meant, right? Um, I'm happy is, with the right avocado. Like, we could just like it's like a mic drop, frankly. But go ahead, you want to keep going? <laughs> it's totally up to you. I was gonna I was gonna go with like some fabulous behavior tip, but if like give, no, 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 don't no, no, tease us. Go ahead, Emily. All right, here we go. So here's my tip of the week. This is not my words, but I repeat them all the time. If you teach your staff this and you keep this in your mind, you will be a behavior superstar. It is kids do well when they can. Uh, kids do well when they can. Kids always want to do well. And so if they are not doing well, there is something going on in the environment that is not working for them. And the best thing that you can do to help that situation is figure out what it is that isn't working. Um, and that is going to fix 98.957% of your behavior problems this summer. Very, very cool. I like it. The other percentage will be fixed by eating avocados that are ripe, of course. So, so if I go to the grocery store in Emily's neighborhood and I go to the avocado section, I'm going to see a whole bunch of avocados with no buttons on their ends. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is correct. And, and let's be honest, would you rather have, like, would you rather shop in a bin of like buttonless avocados or ones that people have like molested to like squeeze them and find out if they're Ooh, right? you see, you win. You win that argument. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried. I'm, I'm. I, yes, I'm, I'm, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna change the title to molested avocados now because oh God. Sounds like or, a good or, band name. or I was going to say, or I'm going to start a <laughs> punk rock name. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, molested avocados. Yes. Oh my God. No, I'm a camp director. It's never going to work. It's never going to fly. So um, thank you, Emily Galinsky. You're fantastic. Thank um, you for having I'm, I'm me. sure we'll have you back, you know, and, and listen, when you start your own, you know, bright moose podcast, you know, think about us. Okay. Because you got it. You got it going girl. All right. So I want to thank our GoPro team, AM Skyer, commercial recreation specialist for allowing us to bring this podcast to you. If you like what you hear, you should subscribe to the day camp pod on your favorite podcast platform. Check out our show notes from this show and other episodes like Michael Brandwine at daycamppodcast.com as well as contact for information for the show from our guest, Emily Galinsky, from my wonderful co-host, Sam, and for Tiff, who's sitting on the beach. That's why I have this digital background going. Thank you for listening and making yourself a better day camp professional. We'll be back next week with a mini pod and in two weeks with another full episode of the Day Camp Pod. Mm -hmm.